it. Hi, I'm not Harpreet, but this is his office hours. And we're not live streaming today. This is just being recorded. So everyone, Russell, Auntie, Eric, there, Aaron, and Dave, thank you. Thank you for coming, because it would have been really weird just having me by myself talking to myself. And yes, that's going to be my name for the rest of this is not Harpreet. You put like an exclamation cool. point in front of Harpreet and we'll know you're talking to me. All right. Kicking it off. Want to know, so what's your data science superpower? Just your data superpower. Do you have one? Do you have one of those things where you look at it and you go, you know, I have a job because I can, or I'm going to get promoted, or I am better than the average data person because do you have a data superpower? And don't jump in at the same time. I mean, come on. Hmm. I'll throw something in if you like. Yeah. Um, so, so, so my data superpower, data related superpower is an analytical mind. I just analyze everything. My wife thinks I'm an alien because my brain just never switches off. I'm always looking at something and picking out. Um, points of significance and joining them together. Uh, you know, if we're watching TV, if we're listening to music, if we're just walking up the street or driving or something, I'm always looking at everything. And I do the same with, with data. Even if I'm looking at raw data, I'm looking at attributes of it uh, where I can, small data sets accepted. You know, I'm no substitute for, for an ML system here. But um, yeah, I like to look at raw data and see things to help um, direct me into the ways to analyze it with um, with formal analytical measures. Do you know what I mean? So what is that? I mean, what, where has that gotten you as far as career wise? What, you know, when you look at your career and you say, if I didn't have this, what do you think you would be? Mm -hmm. I mean, where where do you see kind of the the downsides of not having that analytical thought process that's always on? So I probably wouldn't have gone so far down the rabbit hole of data. And when I say data, I mean, you know, the, the wide data, not just um, data science. Uh, and I probably wouldn't have got to the position where I am now that, you know, I'm on the speed dial for a lot of people when they have any questions or issues related to data or analytics. Um, however, I might have progressed further in uh, a different career if I hadn't done that, because I started off with uh, electrical engineering and then project management before I um, took, a, took a side avenue to concentrate on the data elements of, of, that I was in, employing in both of those fields, but really concentrated on it some 15 years ago now, I think. So yeah, could have been different. And there's, there's positives and potential negatives, but you know, Looking back in retrospect, it's uh, it's easy to throw shade on things. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to think that I'm on the, I opened the right door. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you went the right direction, right? Yeah. Eric, what about you? What's your superpower? You got to think of one by now. Yeah. So uh, I think that not knowing that I can't do something or whatever um, would probably be what I would go with because sometimes I've set out to do things that are, you know, it's like you just biting off more than you can chew. And so like in some ways it's cool because in some ways I see it as a, it could be a liability because it can make me a yes man sometimes. Cause it's like, yeah, yeah, of course we can do that. Let's jump in and try. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it opens up a lot of a lot of doors because it's like I'm willing to try it and I'm gonna sit there and you know like bang my head against the keyboard until something happens or something that I've learned over time is to ask for help um, earlier on when it's like okay I tried this for a while and it was fun uh, but now I'm gonna ask for some help because it could still be fun but I've just reached the end of my capabilities to to figure it out on my own um, so yeah I would say not knowing that I can't do it and being okay with jumping in and trying it anyway. You think that's something you want, like that's going to be your superpower going forward? Or do you think at some point in your career, you're going to say, all right, now I'm done being the, I'll try anything once and I'm going to do something different. Like, are you going to change and switch out your superpower? 
probably to some probably to some extent i think that the attitude of being willing to jump in and try stuff is just i just think it's valuable and i enjoy it and so i'm definitely going to keep it around but at some point i at some point meaning it's been in the past now um i try to be more choosy about just trying anything and instead being saying is this something that can be done i don't really know is it worth my time to try and figure it out <clears throat> you know and then just trying to make a good pre- prioritization decision from there but i like i the attitude is fun and i enjoy it so i want to keep the attitude just try and be a little smarter about it there what do you got there i see a comment in the the chat but go ahead and unmute yourself and let's hear the let's hear the superpower nope he's not going to do it he refuses when i have to read it Yep. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to read it for him. He says my superpower. I don't let it go without finding why it's huge. Why is the scraped data saying 221 records in X? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One. Yep. Let's find out even if it takes hours. I don't know if that's a bad habit. I mean, there, if you want to like chime in, I don't know if that's a bad habit. I mean, some stuff you got to let go. Right. But every once in a while, that one record really isn't just one record. Typically, if there's a problem, it's not limited. There's usually more to explore. All right. Antti, your superpower, it's your turn. Um, I would say that it's uh, the subject matter expertise because I haven't been in the data game that long, but in the music business now for 15 years and had different... uh, different positions like in 10 years I think this is my fourth or fifth one at the moment and I'm now transitioning to a more data um, role next but having that background knowing the people and the and the subject as well as I do I think that's that's a a big one yeah would you call that domain expertise or what would you, I mean, yeah, if you had to yeah. give it a label? Yeah, I think that's, that's it. And is that, you know, same question for Eric, is that something that's going to change? You know, have you found something that's kind of your, this is going to be a long-term superpower or are you looking at it as this will be the five-year superpower and then you're going to jump into, you know, something else or you're looking forward to something else? Um. Yeah, I think so. Um, because at the moment I'm learning everything about R, for instance. So I'm looking forward to that maybe being my <laughs> next next superpower for, for sure. Yeah, because I don't have to learn as much about the music business anymore. That's that's there. That's done. So I'm curious about the next next moves. Yeah, Dare, if you're if you're on, go ahead and unmute and let's hear your superpower. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, like I mentioned, I I think I'm a bit uh, fastidious when it comes to learning. Um I want to I want to be sure that everything is accurate. Uh, something tells me that the, the one data that the one um, record that you are missing might be so important and uh, that it might have other underlying uh, reasons or causes. So I want to get to the very root of it to understanding why it is so. So um, I think uh, that is my superpower. And I do not, uh, it doesn't bother me if I have to spend uh, length and time to discovering why it is so. And I think that has really uh, helped me. It has really helped me um, to learn more and to see new things. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks for thanks for coming in with that. We got Eric. Eric, go ahead and tell us what is, what is your superpower? Um, mine 
is I, I guess just making random connections of things. Um, I'll, I tend to get where I'm talking to somebody about something, a problem they have, and I'll think of a solution in a completely unrelated field that just works very well together. And I guess it comes from just having a very wide interest in totally random things that on the face of it don't seem connected in any way. Um, so, yeah. So how do you think that's helped you? You know, if you look at it and you say, okay, if I didn't have this, where would you be? Um, it's helped me meet a lot of very interesting people and get very interesting opportunities uh, because I might be talking to somebody who um, initially might appear that I don't have anything in common with them, but in conversation, it turns out that we do because of this one thing that I'm interested in that helps them solve their problem. And so it's helped open some doors for me. So who's the most interesting person you've met? Hmm. I have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> okay. That'll be a follow-up question. Yeah. I got to hear Makiko's answer to this one. What is Makiko's superpower? I want to hear this one. Um, I'm going to default to my CEO, Ben's explanation of why MailChimp succeeded. That's because I'm like a cockroach. You can't kill me. <laughs> You're not going to keep me down. No, it was great because um, I think that's actually when I first heard about like MailChimp like years ago was he was doing this creative, like creative mornings talk. And it was the first time I'd heard an entrepreneur just be real, real about their business and like how they like, you know, grew and stayed in the game. And he was like, look, at some point it's just, it's about time, just time in the game and just um, in good times, like what was it like uh, all like, was it uh, all waters like raised ships or whatever, like in good, essentially in good times, everyone's doing well. Um, but you know, it's like how you do in the bad times. And so I feel like that's, that's me. Like, I just, I'm a cockroach. I will hang in there. You cannot squash me and I will just like keep going. Um, and I think, yeah, I may, I may, I guess maybe you could call it grit, but I just think like cockroach. Yeah. I've been asking this to a couple of people, but what's like, where would you be if you didn't have that? Because everybody talks about, well, this is good, that's good, but I mean, good how? Oh, I probably would have committed suicide. I'm, you know, okay. just trigger warning. Like, honestly, uh, my like, yeah, like my mental health in college was really bad. Uh, I, you know, and I don't hide this from people, but I did actually try uh, a couple times in college. It was bad. Um, I had to get emergency counseling at one or two points, um, you know, part of it was having like a fixed mindset. I was so intent on trying to become a doctor. And especially like, I think a lot, a lot of like, I think uh, Asian Americans, uh, immigrant families, or, you know, people who are second or third, you know, whatever, second generation kids or what have you um, probably understand that pressure of like, you have to become a doctor or a lawyer or engineer. Uh, so I try to become a biomedical engineer and I'm like, okay, I can squish the doctor and the engineer together at UCSD, which has a very competitive program. Um, but, you know, I always had this mindset of black and white. I keep trying if I keep sort of, um, I just grinding myself into the ground, you know, in retrospect, it was, it was so totally unhealthy that like that hustle and grind culture that we kind of sort of celebrate even on LinkedIn a lot sometimes, um, and that just kind of broke me. It really did. Uh, but, it, and I always ask myself this, I'm like, you know, I should just kind of give up on life. Why can't I just give up? It would just be so easy. Um, you know, and I was like, I was away from my family. I was very isolated. It would have been so, so easy, but there's just something like in the back of my head that I was always like, no, no, no. Like you can't just, you can't take that final step. So to be honest, I, I just wouldn't be here. Um, you know, with that being said, for everyone who's listening, uh, I really encourage you, if you are struggling, like, do reach out for help, because counseling and therapy has been really, really good. I've utilized various portions of it in various points of my life. I have a lot of friends, especially in tech, who, you know, have some kind of anxiety, um, 
ADHD, bipolar, a lot of my close friends have a lot of these sort of uh, very similar to me. They have various sort of challenges in life that they need extra help. Sometimes it's uh, through a counselor, sometimes it's uh, medical help, sometimes it's both. Um, you know, I think it's just, it's de definitely something that shouldn't be like ashamed about, but, you know, I think you, I think that kind of determination to just not give way, to not be crushed, I think is, is significantly helpful, especially for tech, um, with a lot of the imposter syndrome too. Like even, uh, today I was reading some posts where people were like, oh, well, all boot camp grads are bad. Like. They're terrible. You shouldn't hire them as engineers. And I'm like, look, like there's there's pros and cons, right? Uh, but something that is very true is that you know none of us will have the perfect opportunities in life. Like none of us will have an amazing set of circumstances. Um, I think, Vin, you probably I like, guess an entrepreneur, you you could probably feel that in your bones that a lot of times you don't have these perfect circumstances. You have to like kind of make things work. Sometimes that takes a little bit more than you can think you're capable of giving at that point for years and years and years. Uh, but at the end of the day, like you kind of have to just go and do it. You have to make that decision for yourself that you're not going to go do it. And sometimes you have to go do it even like when you don't want to do it. Um, you know, so yeah, like that cockroach determination, that grit, I think is still got it. <laughs> still got it even after like a terrible week. Terrible, awesome. terrible week. Not the terrible week, obviously, but that's oh, awesome. It's really good. It, it's kind of interesting how your work superpower kind of comes from a life superpower and how we often miss the connection between the two where, you know, people talk about work-life balance and it's like, there's, it's not a balance. It's the same thing, right? And so it's super important to talk about like asking for help, getting, you know, getting any sort of assistance that you need, not just mental help, but you know, just your health overall, just taking care of yourself, taking care of your family. There's a ton of great messages there. So thank you. All right. Um, obviously, if anybody has any other questions aside from mine, because I've got like an entire list of questions, I could spend this whole show just learning myself. But if anybody's got questions, please throw them into the chat and uh, we will get them answered by smarter than me. Gina, outstanding. Let's just run it. Hi, can you hear me? Oh yeah. yeah. I've got old AirPods and sometimes they kind of crap out on me. Um, thank you, first of all, Makiko. Um, that was incredibly brave and really speaks to me and I so appreciate that. Um, you know, a lot of us go through tough times and I think one, maybe one positive even before the pandemic, but in this era we're in, um, are willing to talk about mental health these days and I thank God for that um, because it's incredibly important um, so I just wanted to you know give a shout out of support there um, and I, I, you know I'm sorry I came in a few minutes late so superpowers um, that's an incredible superpower Mikiko talks about because I mean you know such tough times and yet still having that sense of no, there's more left in me, man. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, I kind of, that, that resonated with me too, um, as well as Eric's comment. I mean, I feel like my superpowers are to um, talk across disciplines. I feel like I can basically strike mm -hmm. up a conversation with just about anybody because I'm incredibly curious about people and what they do and, you know, kind of where they come from, you know, their origin story, things like that. And I guess, yeah, the kind of a, I don't think of myself as being extremely determined or organized or, you know, I'm not a hustler necessarily, but I, I've achieved quite a bit. And I think there's just this part of me that's like, when I was in college, I was a bio major and I was underprepared at a very tough school relative to a lot of the other students. And, um, I just was like, I refuse to be weeded out. That may not have been the most rational <laughs> perspective if you, if you saw my computed GPA coming out, but by God, I was not going to get weeded out because I wanted to study biology and I'm really glad I did. And I, I love it, even though now I'm, I'm moving 
you know, over the years I've moved in kind of have environmental background and data science as well. But yeah, it's that that sense of, and even if you get really down and despairing, it's like, but there's, there's still more to do. There's still things I want to accomplish. There's still things I want to give um, to others as much as I can. So um, yeah, I think those are two. And I'm sorry I, if I if everyone else gave theirs and I missed them, but. Um, Oh, that's great. That's what we're looking for. And it's, you know, you kind of hit on it. This is the pandemic seems to have brought, I don't know, mental health to be okay. Cause it didn't used to be okay to say anything about that. And so it's nice to hear a couple of good stories, you know, that turned out well, cause you hear most mental health stories are, they don't have a good ending. And that's the only way it seems like we get it brought to our attention because the people who are survivors and the people who've worked through it, you know, there was a stigma, so well, still is a stigma associated with it. So thank you, both of you for talking through that and talking about it, just getting help and how it works out. It's really important. And thank you for talking and bringing that through. All right. Anybody else want to talk about superpowers? Because I've missed a, missed a couple of folks. I mean, Aaron, Freeze, if you want to, Costa, if you want to jump in, talk about superpowers. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, superpowers, uh, two of them that come to mind. Uh, one that is potentially dangerous, but is also quite useful is um, grit. It's just not giving up, right? Like what, what Gina was talking about, right? Sometimes, uh, and, and I find this is true with a lot of people who do highly technical degrees um, or technical fields of learning, essentially. Um, in engineering, at least in Sydney University and in a couple of the other Australian universities, the, the ones that make it through the engineering degree are the ones that actually like dug through it. It was it wasn't easy, and it's not going to be easy. Anyone who wants to, you know, get into a technical field, there's a lot of stuff that you're not going to enjoy every bit of it. Like that's just a lie. Right? There are entire subjects where I was just racking my brains and and struggling hard to push through. Right. Um, I've said it before, I, I dropped my computer science degree six months in. I just didn't understand coding. And then through my robotics degree, I had to pick up from the assembly level, right? Start with assembly code and then understand C and then understand object orientation, really build it up from scratch, right? Um, that's not going to be everybody's path. Some people are just going to, you know, get it. And that's a superpower, which I just wish I had. It's just getting code. Um, it's something that I had to build up over literally two or three years, right? Um, the, the danger, absolutely, Auntie, this, the responsibility is understanding to yourself what the grit, what the limits of your grit is, right? It, it, sometimes we get into this mentality and some of us, uh, uh, particularly like the background I come from, an Indian background, is like, yeah, you've got to push yourself. You've got to keep going through to study and continue your degree, finish your degree, go through and work, right? There are other paths to get to the kinds of work you want to get to. So you just also got to be really aware of what your limits are, right? And often you're not aware of that. Um, uh, I was in a situation where I was at a job that I didn't particularly like. It was a couple of months in, in a town I didn't really like. And just having the support network around me to call out saying, hey, are you really where you're supposed to be doing what you're, what you're supposed to be doing? Made me kind of trigger this uh, whole rethink smart goals of my life and saying, okay, what's my net value as an individual, right? Um, and having that support network around me helped me kind of figure out, uh, hang on, no, maybe I should be back in Australia for a bit more um, and, and made, that, made that move, right? So having that grit sometimes gets you into a hole that only other people can dig you out of, right? Um, on, on a lighter note though, and this is kind of different to the mental health topic, is the superpower I would love to have is discipline. One of my one of my co coworkers, um, he, he's he's the kind of guy who he, he will sleep at the same time every single day, wake up at the same time every single day, right? And he just knows what he needs to get done and just gets it done within the time that he tells himself he's got to get it for. You know, I, I just I, I'm a more chaotic individual, and I'm just looking at that guy, man. That's a superpower in my mind. I wish I had that. So one of the things that I'm trying to focus 2022 on is discipline. Uh, I have no idea if I'll get there, but um, 
I need to say, yeah. You know, and following up, one thing that I've learned over my career is you kind of go through these, you know, ups and downs of motivation, not like your career is good and bad, but sometimes you're motivated. Sometimes eh, you're going through a year where it's like, I just want to phone it in. But when I'm in that super like accelerated hyper-performing mode, I can't try to drag everybody with me. You know, and that's what I kind of learned is like, that's just me. Like that's, that's where I'm at. And some people are there, some people are at a different place. And so it's great to have grit, but it's also, I think there's an empathy, you know, quantity to that. And I totally relate with everybody that's talked about like having Asian parents. Yeah. 100%. I don't look it, but yeah, I, you know, I've heard words like we are Asian, not Bijan. I've heard that from not my parents, thankfully, but from a friend's parents growing up in Hawaii. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, isn't there? I mean, I can't imagine that's like a, a thing we have a, a corner market on. I'm imagining that's someplace else too. Like everybody has a little bit of that. Just to, I've heard just to that know. from like a bunch of my um, Caribbean, uh, Nigerian, uh, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino. I literally heard that almost like from you, you take a map, it's like just draw a huge swath of here. Here is where all the pressure is going to come from. <laughs> but I think sometimes too, it intersects also with um, um, all economic security, shall we say. Uh, so if you're also like from a family where you know parents didn't go to college or grew up you know i don't want to say poor lower middle class but adjacent <laughs> right like adjacent yeah but um, adjacent ab- absolutely um you know then there's also like this pressure too of like and i thought um what was that movie encantado is that the movie that came out recently? Encanto? 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 Yeah. Yeah. I thought my, it did a really would have shot me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it did a really good job of talk of like looking at that generational pressure. Like, especially if you're the first one in your family to go to college, or like, I don't know. It's just, man, there's just a lot of ways parents can mess up their kids nowadays. Unlimited the number of tools they have. <laughs> yes. And it's kind of scary being a parent now. I just want to I just want to jump on the back of that like I'll I'll, I'll be frank I, I, I get and agree with what you're saying but it's not always the parents either right like so and it's not always if you're from that uh lower middle class adjacent kind of background where you're faced with uh you know financial difficulties or or any of that like I god bless my parents I'm very very thankful that both of them were pretty well educated and were really you know successful in their careers and what they wanted to do um and they never put that pressure on me that hey you've got to get 99 bar so you got it you know that kind of mentality wasn't there but i ended up going to a school where essentially the school was like one of the top schools in the state for and we don't have like and this is public schools i'm talking about not uh, like a fancy private school and that. but essentially one of the top public schools in the state for like 10, 15 years running. And the school had this mentality that, hey, we expect you guys to come second. The grade before mine came fourth in the state across all schools, even competing against like private schools, came fourth in the state. And that grade was seen as the failure grade, right? Like how dare you come fourth in the state when we've had 15 years of coming second in the state. And and that's coming from the other students. That's not, that's just like a, it's an ego push from other 15 year olds and 16 year olds this isn't about like necessarily even parents there, there's a strange economy of ego uh, that mixes into that as well right that hey this is my identity doing well at school is part of my identity right and 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 i and i totally see where that that plays into it as well because that was more where the the pressure to have grit came in for me um but yeah you're right having an awareness of of like financial insecurity or, or, you know, being faced with that, like having parents that grew up in a country where financial insecurity is really visible. Um, I think that there's a big factor in pushing people towards, hey, you've got to go get a degree in a pretty stable um, career environment. It's not an unreasonable 
background to have. And uh, I think those of us who had parents who didn't push that on us uh, are thankful as hell because, like, yeah, they, they, they shielded us from that, essentially. Um, but it still gets to us in other ways, which is the strangest part. Sure yeah, find you. I mean, I think that's one of the things that in some ways I feel like I sort of missed out on was like football cultural culture in the US. Like what's that show? Uh, Monday, Monday Night Lights. I feel like I have friends who've gone to like a lot of these like schools that had the American football, basketball, sports culture. And like when stuff happened, Friday Night Lights, and when stuff like that happened, it's 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 hilarious watching some of these shows on like CBS or whatever, like a lot of these high school dramas, because I'm like, wow, that 100% did not look like my high school. Not at all. Like, yeah, no, we didn't have these like burly American football players and like the cheerleaders and all that all that nonsense of like like toilet papering the the chemistry labs i didn't get it i'm like if that yeah, happens like, oh. i'm australian we don't have that anyway so those shows were always a bit weird to me all right i want to hear gina gina and eric were both like there's been some interesting conversations in the chat that i want to catch and eric i saw your question not ignoring it just want to get through this piece of it and hear some more perspectives on it because this is be honest, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Thanks, Finn. Um, yeah, you know, um, well, first of all, uh, I think it cost, cost of, uh, you mentioned um, when you were a student and you got fourth in the state and that wasn't good enough. Um, I grew up in South Dakota, so pretty homogenous, mostly white people, Northern European type, and also, um, Western South Dakota, where I grew up, a lot of Native Americans. Uh, so certainly somebody from another country stands out. And our chemistry teacher was from India, like not, I mean, her husband, I think, was a professor at the local um, uh, college. But she, so we had this, um, you know, I think it was like Science Olympiad or something like that. And I took a test for chemistry. And I think, let's see. I think I got the fourth best score ever, but, and the best score in a long time, but her response was, oh, I got the best score in a long time. But she said, her first response to me was, you missed these two. It wasn't, you just got the strongest score that we've had in 10 years. It was, you missed these two. And I mean, right then and there, I realized there's a big cultural difference in terms of how um, you know, people in different parts of the world respond. And then not only that, um, when I went to college, I guess I'd never really even heard of the whole idea of you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be an engineer or you're or a lawyer. I'm thinking, well, if, I mean, <laughs> if you're not really in, if you're not really interested in doing that, I don't know how happy you will be. And you may be very good but how happy, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but at the same time, I understand, you know, some of those cultural pressures. I grew up lower middle-class adjacent or whatever you want to call it. So I grew up poor and I didn't want to be poor anymore. You know, got news for you there. It's like, no, thank you. And at the same time though, nobody was pressuring me to do anything. They were just probably happy that I went to college. <laughs> And the farther I could go, the better. But at the same time, I think I was raised with a, you know, oh, you're, you're, you know, you accomplish so much. You're so accomplished. You accomplish things. It's kind of effortless. You know, the family didn't really have to push me or I was kind of, I was very self-motivated. And where I grew up, frankly, it wasn't like some big city where there's all kinds of competition. So it wasn't really that hard. And then I got to my university, which I said is, you know, very competitive. And I struggled and I struggled. So when your identity is built around accomplishment and achievement, and without that, you don't really know who you are, or if you're a worthwhile person, you know, and I don't know how, you know, if you're disappointing, if it's coming externally, and you're disappointing your family, and you feel like you might be embarrassing your family, or you're getting that message. I mean, that is a tough, tough thing. And I guess
I think she did she drop out there? Oh, oh sorry, I mute. guess the there you go. Yeah, yeah you sorry mute. about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know how to how to um, you know come out of that. I mean, hopefully, no one's parents will disown them for uh, you know becoming a stand-up comedian. Who's the guy in Silicon Valley uh, who wrote the book? Um, I think he plays uh, the character Jin, Jin Yang. Oh. He was, what's his name? Do you guys remember? Anyway, he writes about how disappointed his family was because he didn't become, I guess, an educator, teacher, professor kind of person. He became a stand-up comedian. And, you know, they were just like, what is this? Um, but then when he became more successful, then, of course, you know, everybody embraced him and, you know, because it reflects well, I suppose. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, short of, you know, finding other support groups and just nurturing your connections and relationships, I, I, I wonder what others think here. Jimmy Yang. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. That's the guy. His, uh, his book is hilarious. Get the audio book if you get his book. So anyway, I'm curious to know others' thoughts. Um, if, and I know others are patiently waiting, so maybe we move on. Yeah, I think the only thing, uh, let me close with the uh, immortal words of my dad when he found out that I was switching to computer science he, from civil engineering, not happy, uh, was a good way to characterize that phone call. And I think it was three, three years ago when he came out to visit and, you know, we talked about where I was, what I was doing for a career. And he said, you know, when I was a kid, I bought you this Atari. I think you took that a little too far. And that was the, those were his wise words of wisdom of my career. <laughs> there, there's just a level of disappointment that you can never get rid of in some families. And I think that's, but he's, he's good with it now, but I think that's a, it's a strange stigma that follows people around. Derek, go ahead. There you there. Okay. Nope, not there. All right, so Eric, let's go to let's go to your question. You got a question about recommenders again. I think you remember. I think I remember you having another one of these last what, last week, two weeks ago. Yeah, recently it's been on my mind. So I was uh, messaging a, a data scientist from Zapier and asked about what they do with recommenders, and she said that they use a random forest for a, a recommender system. And I had never heard of that before, so I Googled it. Uh, and apparently you can use random forests for recommenders and other um, unsupervised learning tasks. And so I was just wondering if anybody had ever done that or heard of it or could explain the idea behind it. Otherwise, I'm just, just working my way through the Wikipedia page about where that involves unsupervised learning with random forests and stuff. I mean, you can do, uh, you know, I'm going to let everybody else get in in a second, but you can do pretty much anything with any model architecture. So I think I just want to warn you that, you know, and there are some like data science MacGyvers out there who literally with a random forest and, and seven rows of data have come up with something that's wildly accurate. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. <laughs> it just means it worked for some reason. So yeah, anybody else want to chime in random forests for recommenders? Anybody else done that? Mikiko, I got a yes. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to your point. Um, so yeah, to echo it, there are a lot of different ways that you can create recommendation systems. Uh, you can have collaborative filtering, uh, cl content. Collaborative. Yeah, there's collaborative and there's content. Okay, but the general idea is like um, for recommendations, and this is where actually it's like the art of si art and science of coming up with a model architecture for recommendation systems, right? Because um, what what does a recommendation look like? So in Spotify, Netflix, and YouTube, for example, they have this interesting dilemma of we can either recommend stuff that you've already proven to like. We can recommend stuff that people like you like, and we can also recommend stuff that is like way different from what you normally purchase, mm -hmm. but 
we need to sort of introduce some kind of serendipity to it. And so if you kind of translate that into like, let's say for example, like a random forest model, like you knew do a random forest uh, regression or a classifier model, right? Um, you could do a binary like, yes, no, will this person like this thing? Uh, you could do more of a regression where you do like the scoring and then you just set a threshold. Um, so generally speaking, I guess like any sort of like regression model you could hypothetically use in like a recommender. Um, but it, it still comes down to that whole like, how do you define, like how, how do you define the, rec the core idea of the recommendation or your sort of core implementation of recommendation? Is it, are, are you recommending it? Because once again, like uh, you want people, you want to give people the same thing that they have, or do you want to like introduce them to something new? And then the decision, the decision point there is you could either do that persona base, which is I think content filtering, collaborative filtering. I always have to like go back and remember like what, da, da, da. Um, you can either essentially do- is user to user. Yeah, you can either do something that's more of like a persona base or you could do something that's more of like whatever they sort of, their behavior, I guess you could argue. Okay, I kind of wonder like the the thing, I guess the, a little bit more information, like one thing she said when I talked to her was, is predicting item probability. So have you ever used Zapier? Zapier is the tool that it's basically the API that connects all the APIs, right? And so it's saying, you know, oh, you use Salesforce and you use Google Sheets. Well, you'll probably also really like, you know, acuity scheduling or a MailChimp or whatever, right? And so she said that they're predicting item <clears throat> item probabilities, which I'm assuming is another app connection, um, by from user behavior and features. And I don't know what those features are, um, but that's what's gotten them the best results. And so I kind of wonder. As you were talking, I actually kind of thought about this persona thing where I was thinking, gosh, I wonder if if you could have a classifier that would, let's say that you've got 10 personas um, and those 10 personas boil down to a collection of 10 apps each and you could, cla you could classify someone into a persona and then recommend those apps to them. Or I guess you could see which apps based on predictive probability going to all the different applications, but then I guess you just have to have a lot of users because you're going to hit a lot of sparsity because they have Zapier has like a bazillion possible app connections and growing. Um, so anyway, it's kind of helpful to talk through it and kind of hear your hear your thoughts about it. Curious to see if I could make something. Yeah, I think the most success. Sorry, um, then go ahead. No, go ahead. Good. I was going to say I think the most successful products they don't take one approach to it, right? They usually will stack or layer. Oh, okay, let me phrase this. Um, so they can either like stack models where they kind of feed models into each other. Um, and a lot of times they'll do that if you want to sort of enrich like the feature set. Uh, or what they can do is they can say, uh, screw it, we're not going to try to blend models. What we're just going to do is we're going to do everything. So like Spotify kind of does that. They have that stuff that you like, right? They have your playlist, right? Your um, like mix one, two, three, four, five, six, or whatever, right? Um, they also have stuff we think you may, might like. And then they also have things that are like, so if you took the hypothetical, if you took the embedding of like all the different songs and the different genres, what they might do is they might say, we'll pick the ones that are like closest to you. We'll also potentially try to add a little serendipity and pick the ones that are like farthest away from your interests. Because it winds up happening is that if they keep recommending the same stuff, it's just kind of going to spiral into this like death sort of yeah echo chamber. Thing. Just yeah, music, yeah. I guess. So <clears throat> a lot of times they'll sort of pick a portfolio approach to recommendation models, and they'll basically like, why don't we just try like a bunch of different stuff, and then we'll A/B test it and see like what works, um, and all that good stuff. So Spotify's really they have a really awesome I think experimentation culture because of that. Same with Amazon, um, YouTube, uh, for sure, um, and TikTok, apparently. All right. Yeah, I did hear something about the, uh, or read about the um, 
like you said, people who are way different from you, you could say, what do, one of the ideas was what do people who are way different from you dislike? Maybe you'll like that. Um, if you've, even if you've never heard it, which I'm kind of interesting, I'm interested to see what that would be. Cause I don't know who people are way different from me, let alone what they dislike, how you would choose that. Cause lots of people are way different from me. Um, just depends on which, you know, access or whatever you decide to go down, uh, to find them. So interesting approach. Cool. And there's a lot of like what you're talking about with basically a distance metric of one sort or another, where you're looking for how far away people are from each other. And there's that concept of wraparound where you have, you know, this person hates it. They are very different from you. You and it almost wraps around to a different class or a different type of user. But and I think Makiko was kind of bringing this up, but I want to make it explicit. There's two ways, kind of two schools of thought about recommenders one of them is i want to just keep giving you you know kind of things that i know you're going to like or that you're very likely to enjoy you know and i want you to find some new diversity some variety because you know i only have so many products to sell you or something like that the other ones are behavioral where you are actually creating more than just here's something to check out you're really creating marketing loops. You're creating other behavioral loops where you can create rituals and the person that you're targeting. Now you're trying to change their likes. You're trying to change their preference and understand what it takes to take somebody from this type of a customer to a different type of customer or to consuming a different type of, you know, higher price range or, and so there's yeah. two, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought on what you should do with a recommend. Well, there's more than two, but those are the two simplest ones. And so that, also keep that in mind. You may not want them to do exactly what's obvious and easy. You may actually want to take them on more of a journey. That, that might actually close the loop a little bit on why a random forest in certain cases might work well, right? So random forest where I've used it more because I haven't touched recommendation systems before is um, exploration for robotics. So area exploration where there's uh, an empty space and the robot doesn't know anything about it before. Uh, so there's a combination of, do I explore new frontiers or do I exploit the areas that I already know, right? In an unknown area like exploration space. So essentially this is that explore versus exploit balance that, you, that you're talking about, Vin, where you can either continue to exploit the stuff that you know you can recommend and it's an easy win, or you can explore the areas that a person's maybe never seen this movie before, if it's a Netflix thing, for example. Um, so that may be the, the nature of why a, a random forest model might still work well in certain cases, depending on how you want to be able to balance that explore exploit trade off. Cool. I like that. I like that thought a lot. The other selling point that um, our dear friend, oh God, um, i trying to remember. It's Friday. Yang. Mr. Rogers. No, our, our, um, our Excel, right, a random Dave forest Langer. friend. Yes. Something he likes to bring up a lot is that um, random forest too, like they are um, more interpretable than other types of models. Uh, they're fairly efficient. Um, throw, if you throw the data at them, they can handle um, ordinal and categorical variables a little bit better than some other types of models. The only, I think, challenge, well, the main challenge I know about them is um, you can kind of, I don't want to say game them a little bit, um, but essentially like if you have features that have a lot of splits or like they have a lot of values um you can kind of because essentially the genie coefficient for random force once happening you can get a, like a really high genie coefficient so you can have like variables that essentially for example like if you have a variable that is um like state or city actually city is a better one city maybe region or neighborhood uh you can kind of like Reinforced models will sometimes weight those features a lot more than like other types of models because of like the whole, the thing with like the gene coefficient. Um, if I remember that, I'd, like I think that was an issue like when we were, for example, using like, still, still 
a, be, a good model to use, like a good starting one, absolutely. Um, but that was something that I think we had issues with when we were trying to do sales modeling with like data from Salesforce. And you have essentially all these users and customers. And if you're trying to use like neighborhood or um, city or region or whatever, um, like, a like a categorical feature set that has a lot of values, I think that's where sometimes we got, it gave it a little bit more importance than maybe it should have. So I think that's the one drawback. Good to know. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on recommenders here before we get to a customs question? Thank you. All right. Eric, I hope that gave you some good answers, some good places to go with recommenders, our recommendations on recommenders that you will hopefully like. All right, Kostov, it's all you. All right, okay. So um, I'm working with uh, image data sets, right? And uh, one of the things that we needed to do is keep track of the, the source of the data set. Right, uh, and there's a bunch of metadata that we're tracking about it. Essentially, it's metadata, right? Where did it come from? What's the nature of the uh, what of the content that's in there? Um, and, and there was a bit of a toss up: is do we, do we go through with like an SQL um, database that has all this information in it, um, and what's the overheads of doing that? Versus, hey, we don't actually have any SQL experts uh, within the team that controls this. Uh, let's just chuck it into a JSON and put it on Firestore, right? Um, so that was the other, <laughs> that was the other uh, like potential avenue, right? So we, we wanted to be able to control some of it, like the structure of the document and be able to actually use that as a functional uh, object so that we can track how things are progressing, right? With, with that particular data set. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing, uh, thing where we ended up getting a, basically using Pydantic to enforce the structure of a model uh, in certain areas where we really care about it, but leaving it loose enough that we can add additional information on top of the uh, JSON where we need it, right? Um, has anyone done something like that before? Or does that sound like, hey, if you wanted that, you should have just done a SQL database? Am I barking up the wrong tree? You might be, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> image data is hard and I'm gonna let Makiko kill it, but. I'm just going to tell you this, that image data, there's, it's like, there's no right answer. And that's kind of the problem with image data is that no matter, you know, no matter what direction you choose, you're going to feel like there was something that you missed or something lacking because there isn't, I mean, you're struggling with like kind of the, the existential problems that some companies create customized systems to, to manage. So on that note of there is no right answer, I'm going to let Makiko give the right answer. There is no right answer. <laughs> no, I think because this comes back to, um, and as like a, not a data engineering expert, but as someone who's admiring data engineering experts that I am studying from, um, I feel like it's it comes, like that question of like, what kind of data storage mechanism someone uses? Like, unless someone is doing, so, I, so if I go, okay, so let's say just cloud storage, uh, GCP, right? Um, they have tons of options from everything from unstructured data to, um, you know, structured uh, databases, both relational, non-relational. Um, I think it what it comes down to is like your read writes, essentially uh, the latency and also cost. So, for example, like if you already know for images, they probably would be stored in like a GCS bucket or something like that. Um, and same with AWS, they would be stored in like an AWS bucket or, or um, E at S3, 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 sorry. I live in GCP, but I, yeah. um, so then at that point, if it's just collecting the metadata, if you want like a really like loose, almost like MongoDB style, like schema, you could, you could do that. Um, another option is like BigQuery is a relational, it's a relational OLAP system, but they are now allowing unstructured data in there. So that could kind of be the best of both worlds. And BigQuery is a fair, fairly stable product on like the GCP side. Uh, AWS, I'm sure, has their version of it, which might be Redshift, I think. Um, 
but yeah like at that point it's just kind of like ah, just just stick in a sql database um you know like you could use the uns you could use the unstructured like column i think um because it's a columnar database uh you could like if you want stick the json in there and then as you just kind of get a little bit more structured data for stuff that you would normally use you'd probably still use pydant pydant pydantic anyway if you're doing like the inserts um for your like data validation and enforcement and type enforcement but i i would go like literally the most vanilla super easy path possible and that would be like a big like using bigquery or something like bigquery with like a bucket for the images mm. um because the other part too mm. right is the more boring you make it the easier you make it to hand it off to someone else Oh, and also too, if you have a, an agreement with uh, Google, with GCP or Amazon, then you can kind of force them to help you out if something messes up. No, that's, that's, that's those are very good nice, points. Like support and, and cost and latency and some of that uh, weighs in, right? Um, yeah, like uh, you guys, right? Obviously like the image data is in like a GCP bucket. Um, I would not try to do anything else with that. Uh, but, but essentially, yeah, it was, what are we going to be quicker at as, as predominantly Python developers was to kind of make this, uh, like an interface class essentially that just deals with the Firestore documents and only modifies it in ways that we want it to be modified in, uh, so that all of our pipelines can use that particular handler. Um, and it's essentially like a, the, this, this handler interface to the doc in Firestore and says, okay, these are the actions you can do to that document. Um, so that, that's how we're kind of like programmatically controlling a lot of that stuff. Now, I, I think a lot of that was, kind of, I'm looking at that going, there's a sunk cost fallacy here where it's like, we've already done so much on this, we can just build a quick API to strap other stuff onto it, like, you know, a dashboard or whatever. But is, is there like value in moving over to like a SQL database if, a certain percentage of that is structured and part of it is unstructured. I might have a closer look at BigQuery now that you mentioned that, if they're open with unstructured data as well, that might be an interesting yeah. progression. Because yeah. the, the truth of the matter is, this is not going to ever be fully fixed and structured. Do you know what I mean? Like we started off with the bare minimum MVP was a very tightly structured document, but it in the nature of image metadata, it, you're, you're suddenly starting to get other bits adding to it, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, that, I'm, I'm just kind of juggling a sunk cost fallacy here. It's like, we've already got this thing that works. Is it worth putting any effort into getting that into, like, are there any really big wins out of SQL? I think the main thing we're seeing right now is a little bit of latency out of like Firestore and things. Um, but yeah. You've always got to think about what are you going to do in the future? I mean, if this is what it is and it's not really changing that much, I mean, how much are you going to be, how much are you going to be adapting in the future? How dependent upon this are you going to be in the future? You know, is this something that's pretty sta static and stable or is this the kind of project that you're going to be leveraging and improving on over the next year or two? I think, so, so this started off, um, this started off as like a stable MVP kind of thing saying, hey, this is what it's going to be. We don't need anything more than this. And then now we've grown a little bit. We've extended that and just found some edge cases where like, okay, we need to loosen a few things here. We need to change a couple of things there. But I suspect it's actually going to stabilize uh, across, say, at least a year or so. Um, after that, as as the project evolves to a, to a further phase, it's, uh, it's likely to change, right? But... At the same time, is it worth trying to look around that corner right now when what we have right now essentially works with a couple of additional tweaks uh, and can see us through for another, you know, X amount of months? And I can tell you in that case, wait. Wait until you have the detail of what it's going to look like in a year. You know, just limp it along. You're going to hate it a little bit. But if it's just edge cases, you know, learn to hate it. And then when you have clarity on what you have to change, you know, especially with image data, because you can go down, I've seen companies have to do forklifts because they went the wrong way. So don't, you know, have specifications up front. Anybody yeah, else want to so chime in on this? Fine. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Makiko. I, I totally agree with like Ben. Yeah. I mean, like if it's already working, 
I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Anybody worked with image data recently? Because my last image data thing was two and a half years ago. All right, Kostov, I hope that was helpful. Hope that got some answers. Um, anybody else have any other questions? I've been trying to keep track of the chat, but it would be very easy in the mix of Mandalorian music and ukulele references to have missed something. Anybody else have any other any questions to ask? I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, I was um, driving earlier, so I didn't get a chance to um, provide any answers to any other questions that may have been asked earlier. <laughs> um, so, so we're kind of working on something where we're rolling out some new, like a, a new app for our customers. And um, there's a lot of business cases revolving around, you know, we're rolling out an app to have certain features to interact and reach out to our customers in different ways. So um, as we start to collect data, there is a discovery slash question around just which particular features of the app correlate to since you got a customer churn, right? You know, we have you know, a childcare business where we want people to stay as long as possible. So we're trying to correlate certain app features and interactions with customers to satisfaction, things like that, which are leading indicators of um, retention, right? Um, so, you know, trying to, you know, we don't really have many of those skills or capabilities. So trying to upskill the team, like we have some people who are, you know, are familiar with kind of doing predictive models and things like that, but trying to, Think about the approach because from the business perspective is kind of you know let's do some correlation analysis to figure out you know if they will send five text alerts or five video shares that more so correlates to them staying longer um i mean i think of correlation as kind of the first step or like it's good to correlate but you also want to use it to you know maybe for predictive models to do much more machine learning use cases so um just thinking about the approach around you know once we start to gather a lot more data can pull it down to a customer level or a location level, just those type of analysis to kind of do that type of correlation. Or there's maybe there's different perspectives around how to do that analysis to figure out like which particular features of an app are correlated to increase service customer satisfaction or retention or length of stay or things like that. What kind of behavioral data are you gathering right now from the app? Um, so essentially it's, it's like, saying, like if I, like if I have a child in a, in a school, if we do, if we're sending parents photos, if we're sending them updates around your child ate, you know, food today, they went to the bathroom, this is their lesson plan. So it's kind of those behavior around, these are the things that your child are doing. Also like video, if we send a video, um, photos, all those different types of behavioral things or during the day, these are the things that your child are doing. So the question is like, what are those quote unquote quality behaviors of what are the combinations of things of behaviors in the app the more so correspond to customers saying, okay, I like that versus that I don't really care about as much. And so you're looking at retention on the app or are you looking for like service retention for people staying at the, keeping their kid in the daycare or the, the school? Yeah, so we have a point of sale system. So that's how we track disenrollments, um, people staying for a length of time. We know what the first time they arrived versus the, first, versus the last time that they left. Um, we do use... Uh, customer satisfaction surveys so we do have those surveys with a separate system that can track you know that type of sentiment um so it's really those two it's like customer satisfaction type of sentiment as well as just overall length of stay of people staying for a particular length of for a length of time who wants to dive in on this before i you know take over and i shouldn't I would just say the gold standard is always uh, randomized uh, experimentation and testing. Um, I think I had this issue over or this challenge over at uh, Teladoc. Uh, so we were trying to predict like retention or specifically activation um, in this case of um, our, our clients members um, so essentially, you know, we have open enrollment, we want them to enroll in our behavioral and um, chronic health condition, you know, devices and programs and services. We kind of need to figure out, you know, who are the people who are like, they're just taking a little bit longer and we kind of need to help them out uh, based off of when the ship, uh, the device is shipped to them, like a diabetes monitor, et cetera. Um, versus people who are just never ever gonna sign up and we can send them emails. 
And we've tried to do historic analysis in the past. And I think that is the thing, right? Like we could get to the correlative data and you can get that actually from, from um, machine learning models. So for example, you could build, uh, if you're trying to predict like days to like li a lifetime customer value or, you know, lifetime of a customer, uh, we, like we had the data, we could, we had how long they stayed. Um, so we could get to those like correlative features and aspects, but that wouldn't tell us the why, right? And like randomized experimentation, that will kind of give you a little bit more, um, a little bit more weight on any sort of like causal analysis um, driven sort of uh, initiatives. So I think that's that, like, I think that's the only thing that I would really think about is it can kind of tell you maybe the what, but it won't ever tell you the why until you do some kind of experimentation. And there is a lot of different methodologies for how to approach it. And, and obviously when you're doing it with people and families and children, you always want to be very like sensitive to like how that's kind of set up. Um, especially also with sample sizes. That's another thing that we at least had challenges with is that to get a certain, um, to measure the effect size, we, need, we did need a certain kind of sample size. Um, and that was a little bit hard to get to sometimes just because of our enrollments um, and all that. So yeah, but I think that's the main thing I'm, I'm like thinking about. Did you do any kind of treatments of people? Like since for our case, it's gonna be rolled out to everybody. So did you, with your experimentation, do you treatments around a particular sample size that was using certain features versus people who were not using for certain features or were everyone, did everyone since have the same features of, of Teladoc? Yeah, so they, we actually had different populations. Um, so we had, for example, like a Medicare, Medi-Cal Advantage uh, or Medicare Advantage population. Um, we had a more general population. So we partnered with like Home Depot, for example, we're covering all their employees. So that's not necessarily like a Medicare, Medi-Cal specific population. Um, and then we also partnered with some like big insurance uh, plans or big insurance companies. And then they would sort of determine the level or the, segment, the segments that we would cover and kind of what sort of coverage. So there's like a lot going on. Um, that was one reason why like it was a little bit hard sometimes to get the sample sizes that we truly needed. Uh, the other part that is really important is the effect size. At what point would you, what, at what point would you call a difference in behavior meaningful, for example? So um, let's say for example, you do a campaign, like a push notification um, or an email campaign. Uh, if you find that, and let's say you do it over a short period of time, let's say you find that people who in the treatment group are a lot more active and engaged in the beginning. That doesn't always translate to a higher lifetime value or a lifetime like retention on the app. Um, some of that stuff, it just, it, it, it takes time. And that's where the correl correlative sort of analysis can help. It can at least help you make the business case to say, you know, we should do this kind of study. Um, but other times, for example, let's say, let's say all the groups are equally engaged. Uh, let's say, for example, one group, they like or comment more on those like SAS updates that you send through the app. That's great. Is there business value to that? Some product managers would say like, yeah, that's like absolutely awesome. Some marketing people would say like, well, but are they like word of mouth referring us to like other families? So I think it's one of these things where like, you have to figure out kind of like, what's the, what's the behavior you wanna measure and is it measurable? And then at that point, what's the effect size that you can quantify? And then from there, that's usually where you determine uh, the sample size that you need and also the duration of like the experiment. So for example, if you're Google, they can probably run an experiment in like a day and call it good just because they have so many, such a huge volume of people coming through that no matter what they do, it's going to be statistically significant. Um, if you're like 
a medical insurance company, uh, you don't always have that many samples or you, anything medical behavioral wise. Sometimes you don't have that same sample size. So you need to like run it for longer. So that's, that's the, the kind of the key thing when you're thinking about like duration of experiment and also uh, the sample size. Hope everybody realizes that was a about seven minute masterclass in experimental design, like just the foundations of experimental design right there. That wasn't bad. That was, that was, that was, you know, if you're, if you're watching this on video, rewind and listen to that again, because that was really important stuff. And I think, you know, the sampling, like half of your first experiments are going to be just to figure out your samples and to figure out, excuse me, not your samples, your populations. Like that's going to be the first, I don't know, few months, maybe even longer, is going to be figuring out exactly how granular you can get your populations and how you can figure out the segments within each, because you're going to have some significant diversity because you have kind of this service that everyone uses. There isn't like a, a specific demographic, you know, aside from having kid. So you're, you are just kind of across the, if you're human, you could potentially be using your, your service and your app, which makes it really hard to, you know, it's almost like a Google size problem. It makes it really hard to figure out how to get your, your segments and your stratification, right. And before you do that, you can't really do experiments. Well, I mean, it'll look like you're getting strong results, and then you'll do something similar. You'll, you'll like repeat it once and then realize, wait a minute, why did we get two different results? Same treatment. We thought the same conditions, same stratification. And so reproducibility is going to be a big thing for you in the very beginning. Don't just assume one, uh, one trial, one experimental run is enough. It's, it's typically being able to repeat it and giving, a, giving yourself a higher level confidence in your methodologies. That's going to be really important up front. And then you're going to get granular on what you're measuring. And that's what I've usually, that's kind of the process that I'll go through is get granular on stratification, get my methodology kind of sound, just figure out my practices. You're going to have to build a platform to support a bunch of this stuff because it gets complicated quick. And you want to do these experiments as simply as possible. They may take a long time to run, but you don't want, it to be your time taken up building, designing, implementing the experiment itself. So build a platform to handle as much of this as you can. And then it's really getting to the point of reliability and how deep do you want to go in this versus how much business value you're getting out of it. Because a lot of times just understanding basic correlation gives you a lot of value. Even though you don't truly understand the mechanics, you understand enough about it because you're trying to predict, you know, trying to reduce churn, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and churn only has so much value. You know, losing 50 customers versus 25, you know, obviously you want to go after something that has significant value. But when you start taking all the big stuff off the table, these experiments can kind of become extremely expensive and not very lucrative. And that's the, that's the other problem is once you get that first year's worth of discovery and understanding under your belt, it's kind of time to say, okay, how much more of this do we really need to do? Because it will get expensive quick and you can chase rabbit holes that just aren't worth the money. And, you know, I don't know how, how many customers you have, but if you're not dealing with millions, it, it starts getting to, you know, diminishing returns really quickly. And then do you, then as last follow-up is, as we think about doing the correlation analysis and then trying to flip that into like a predictive model, like, is that a helpful thing? Like we think about the big KPIs we're trying to draw on is like length of stay or customer satisfaction. Like, is it valuable to really have those correlations to do the feature engineering to figure out those predictive models, which can be used to feed back into the app to say, hey, like, you know, these are the things that you should be doing today that we believe that's going to help out in terms of getting people to stay or increasing your customer satisfaction. So it's kind of the feedback loop of taking the, the feedback from the correlation to feedback to make the application a little more intelligent to know what we should be recommending that people do. 
think the smartest thing I've ever heard about churn is that churn is an event. And if you were trying to predict churn, you're trying to predict that event or at least discover it before the person leaves, but also before you're at a point of no return. And so it's kind of a, it's an interesting problem because you can detect churn and be correct and still not be able to prevent it. Mm -hmm. And so what you're, you know, the metrics aren't really, it isn't so much important to say, this is what, you know, leads to churn or this person is, has a high probability of churn. You know, it's predicting the event the thing that caused churn and that usually doesn't happen on your app. If you're, you know, if there's a service behind what it is that you're doing, the event that ties to the churn isn't always something that you have data about. You're only gathering data after the fact about how people's behaviors change and shift over time. And so what you're really trying to do is get your predictions as close to that event as possible and understand what your horizon is for making a behavioral change or having some intervention that will actually change the event and prevent the churn because that's not always possible you may detect it but not detect it in enough time so you know when you're talking about a prescriptive model because that's kind of what it sounds like you're getting to is now you want to build more of a prescriptive model now you have something now you have a more complex problem isn't it isn't so much this person is because now you're going from predictive to prescriptive and so you want a high level of accuracy to predict a person churning but in order to do something to actually be able to recommend an intervention you have to understand a little bit more and it's more than just the kpis of churn itself it's understanding the cycle and like i said finding out more importantly what the event that led to it in the first place was which you may not be able to do Yeah, I think, and I, I think this is like part of the why statisticians don't like data scientists and machine learning people because um, if you look at the original usage right for regression models, it was less about. So, for example, if we use a model for predicting BMI, it was less about predicting the BMI and more about understanding how the features. Um, interact with each other, like what features are sort of the biggest contributors to like, for example, someone's BMI and how do those um, features like interact with each other? So the original sort of like predictive models were more to understand and to help kind of set up experimentation to figure out what are the right, like what are the right um, initiatives or policies or procedures to put in place to sort of address that like outcome or behavior, right? So I think ideally the way it would probably like, as Vin sort of described is you have your correlative analysis and then you, I, and I almost don't wanna say a predictive model. I, I kind of just wanna call it like a, a machine learning model. Um, you essentially like build a machine learning model off of that data. It gives you some insight. You can use like feature inference or Shapley or some other sort of model interpretability tools to understand, you know, what are what features are um, being like what features stack rank in terms of like contribution to that prediction, uh, which ones are like the highest predictors of like the outcome, and then that will help you help set you up for figuring out what should you experiment on, and then what can you then um, prescribe like as a procedure to say, cut down on churn and to increase retention. So, I mean, that would be the ideal thing. I think what I see a lot of times is that uh, people, they have the correlative analysis, they build the models, and then they focus a lot on like the predictive power. And they kind of forget that whole, all models, all models are bad, some are useful. Um, they forget about the like, is it now useful? Um, and then also to, for example, just because you're capturing like a historic trend in the features, uh, that might not, and let's say for example, you like implement a new initiative or you implement a marketing campaign or some kind of nurturing sequence. Um, if you see like it trending and the model is still predicting very well, that would mean that like that marketing campaign is actually totally useless. But from the perspective of, of model accuracy, your model is now more accurate. 
but from a app perspective, <laughs> um, that initiative didn't do much, right? And so that's where the um, you kind of want to also build in that experimentation layer or stage in that procedure. And I do think sometimes like not thinking about it as a predictive model, but thinking of it just like as a machine learning model. And then you essentially want to get to that prescriptive modeling or that sort of prescriptive stage, I think really, really kind of helps. But that would be the ideal sort of workflow is you have the core of analysis, um, you know, that sort of provides the business use case of, um, you know, let's build some models. Let's see if we continue to see these kinds of trends. Let's see if uh, the model picks up on any other potential interactions between these features. Let's then uh, think about, you know, queuing them up for experimentation. And specifically like, you know, in this case, time on the app. Um, let's think about some hypotheses. Is, are people like leaving because they're not engaged? like early on? Are they leaving because um, they don't like the right features? Are they leaving because they don't like support? And then do the experimentation off of that. And then see from there, like, what would be the next sort of like procedure or what would be the, the uh, treatment you'd want to recommend? Russell, you had something in the comments that actually is really good to bring up. Can you Say again, then I clicked. No, you had something in the comments that was actually really good to bring up. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so I wrote about churn, saying that I think the event of churn is more like a a wave than an individual event. I.e., there's a lot of sub events that have to coincide for the the parent event to trigger. Um, so, whilst we can try to try to halt the parent event, what we want to do is identify all of those those child events and monitor those and monitor the uh, the transition over time of those, pick up the trends and try and predict when there's going to be um, uh, a number of events happening at the same time that is likely to trigger the parent event. Uh, and it's unlikely also, I think, that we'll be able to remove those altogether, but the best we can hope for is to reduce the number of the parent events, i.e. the churn itself. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting to, to identify the different types and flavors of events that can contribute to churn, because there's probably a, a huge amount and there's a, there's a scale of, um, should we call it weight with those events? Some are going to be a high contributor, some are going to be a low contributor, so maybe you get 10 low contributing events that really won't trigger that parent, but you know, two high weighted events will almost certainly do it and any permutation thereof. So it's a really interesting subject to, to dig down into the roots of, to try and identify all of those uh, potential contributors. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, cause, cause it's interesting for our business, like we know everyone's going to leave, right? It's at some point, your kid's going to leave. So it's more about extending the time they stay with us versus like, like you know, we're not Amazon where we hope people stay forever. It's like, hey, at a certain point, your kid's going to go to school and they're gone. So it's kind of a, how do you extend that out? But I do get your point around really those events that are predictors. So essentially you're trying to weight those events and that's where you're trying to get at is those particular events, not the churn itself, but it's just the events that make someone leave sooner than we would like them to stay, you know, from birth until five years old. But how do you get the events to get them the same longer as that we're trying to get towards? Yeah, exactly. And and I think you've also got some wildcard events that are those that are, that are outside of the professional capacity, i.e. Um, personal domestic issues that can contribute to a person leaving, which you really want to take out of the, the model that contributes to churn because they have no direct correlation. Uh, but if you're just pulling everything into the picture, you may end up with a, with a chunk of those given uh, a large um, audience, uh, sorry, not audience, but a large contributing um, uh, field to the to the model. All right, Aaron, is that a good? Got the answers? Absolutely, appreciate it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm probably going to listen to the recording again just to make sure I got everything. But yeah, it's good. Yeah, play back what Makiko and Russell said because those two were. Uh, that was kind of dead on exactly. 
All right, Dare, you've got a question. It's going to be our last one because I'm I'm killing Harpreet's bandwidth going over time. All right, Dare's going to make me read his question again. He's going to do it to me again. Yep, he is. All right. Uh, can you hire someone based on what they can do looking at the projects that they have done rather than passing tech screening and tech questions? Uh, yeah, but I'm going to let somebody else answer a whole lot more comprehensive than that. Who wants to, who wants to take the slam dunk around the corner? Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, yes, yes, you can. Uh, essentially any tech screener is going to be hyper specific to whatever you ask them you're not asking them what you know you're asking them do you know this those are two very different questions um like coming from a robotics background moving into the uh machine learning space my uh, advantage is that i understand the physics and the electronics behind how sensors work on a platform right that's a completely different mindset and and, and background technical knowledge to someone who's come from a pure data science statistical background. You give us the same test, it's asking a fish to climb a tree, right? Um, and both of us could bring a lot of benefit to the same team, to the same project, potentially in different ways, potentially in ways that you don't know, right? Like everyone doesn't know what they don't know, including recruiters and hiring managers, right? You might know 75% of what that role requires, to, to win based off what you've seen in your last experience, but I'm willing to bet that there's at least 25% of leeway in most roles where someone with a completely different perspective could solve the problem differently. Um, you ask an electronics engineer, a software engineer, and a mechanical engineer to solve the same problem, uh, you'll come up with about six different solutions from three people. So, yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more on that one. All right, who else? I mean, Makiko, you said you had three offers and no tech screening. Yep, yeah, this was um, 10, 11 months ago. Basically, when I joined MailChimp, I had competing offers from um, Levi's and uh, Cisco Meraki, um, both for like ML engineer roles. Um, so I kind of start off as an ML engineer in my current role, but we, we're kind of more ML ops. Um, and then I had another, there's a couple other companies I was interviewing for where they were sort of like flexible because of how badly they wanted someone in the role. <laughs> so outside of the big tech companies, um, it really comes down to the culture of the company. Um, so for example, some of the companies that I read with, for them, culture was a lot more important, honestly, than like proving capability. I, I don't say proving capability, like, or I don't want to say culture was more important, but what they found was that having a very smart jerk was a lot more detrimental to the productivity of the team than having really nice people who are capable of doing the work even if they have not proven that they have directly worked on that thing. I.e., if you had adjacent skills and experiences and you were a nice person and you could kind of think through problems at a higher level, level domain, they thought that was more important. Um, and especially to like some roles, it's just really hard to like, they'll do those really stupid lead code things, which I get, I, I get in some cases are useful, um, but for a lot of roles, um, at least that I've interviewed for, the skill set and the type of role, it's so complex that there is legitimately no way you could test candidates for that unless it was like a take home. And if you do that, you risk chasing away candidates that are actually really good. And there's like, nah, bro, mm, not doing this. Um, I, I personally really loved take home stuff and system design interviews. Like that's my jam, not cause I'm actually any good at it, but just cause I think it's like intellectually interesting and I get to learn a lot. But um, yeah, like, so during that that time, that last Facebook and Amazon, for example, I was interviewing with them and some other company. Um, 
they were like, yeah, we're going to put you through the whole gambit. And at that point, I was like, yeah, it's not worth it for me. I'm, I'm okay. I don't need a fang job. What I really want is a good team. I want interesting work. Um, I want a great manager. You know, I, I want like a market value pay, but I'm okay if it's not like monopoly money, you know. Um, so for me, I kind of made that choice to basically go like, okay, I'm only going to interview for companies that don't do a tech screen. Um, and I honestly didn't even realize that was a choice until uh, I was taking the full stack deep learning workshop. One of my TAs, like I was kind of grumbling. I was like, oh man, like, you know, I'm not getting any bites on this. And I'm like, oh, is this like a really, maybe I should just take a job as a data scientist, even though I really hate the work. So maybe I should just do it. Um, and he was like, yeah, you could just not do any tech screens. And I'm like, what? That's an option. He's like, yeah, instead of spending like two, three months doing lead code, what you could do is basically just um, be willing to apply to a lot more places, uh, open up the like portfolio of companies, as long as I'm okay not doing a big tech company, big tech company. But if I'm okay with doing a SMB or you know something that's not big tech or a traditional tech industry, lots of companies are willing to be really flexible. Um, if I can show that I have a nice little niche, so it's like I worked as a data scientist. I was I did some stuff in data engineering. I did some stuff in like more the ML ops world. So in a lot of like ML ops types roles, for example, it's so niche that could you really, do you really want to say, oh, we only want to hire someone that does AWS, Terraform, Python, whatever. No, because you need, you need operations, you need ops at like every level of the stack and every company has a different stack. So a lot of those types of roles, people are like willing to be like, okay, you know, we'll, you know, we're not going to be those people when it comes to interviewing. Um, let's just try to see if we can get any candidates. Let's sure they make sure they're nice. They are capable of figuring out the solution, even if they don't know it off the top of their brain. Um, and let's kind of invest in those candidates. So those companies and jobs do exist. It does require giving up on Fang, though. I will say that. Because in a lot of cases, those companies, they have, because they have such structured processes, if they do deviate from those, it looks really bad, like, to bring a candidate in. And also, too, as a candidate, if, like, everyone knows that you didn't go through the same, like, hazing ritual that everyone else did, that also kind of feels bad. Um, it's a hazing ritual, right? So, yeah. But as long as you're willing to give up on, like, as long as, or not you, but, like, it, as long as someone, if they're okay not getting a job at a fan company, it is 100% possible to have a well-paying, interesting, creative job with cool people without a tech screen. Totally possible. I'm an example. Awesome. And then I, I want to hear Russell's, I, I want to hear that out loud because that was, that's another epic comment, but go ahead, Costa, you go first and then Russell can, can take us home with the uh, no a-hole rule. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, Mickey go, yes, that's an option. I didn't realize that either for a while. It, it is an option. It comes down to how you negotiate with the, your interviewers, right? It's a conversation at the end of the day. Every interview process is a conversation, right? There are things you're going to want to do. You're not going to want to do, but I, I feel like in this room, we maybe have a little bit of a bias against the tech screen, right? So let's play devil's advocate here for a second. In what situation do I reckon a tech screen is actually useful, right? Um, now, I, I reckon, look, put yourself in the shoes of a FANG recruiter, right? You've got 10,000 candidates applying every single year, right? And you've got to sift through them and you want a process that's slightly better than random select from list of, you know, PDFs that are, <laughs> you know, resumes. Like, you want something slightly better than that. And I've literally heard shocking stories. And, and this maybe goes back to the 90s and the early 2000s where, You'd get HR right stacked with a bunch of resumes. They chuck them on the floor. Anything that lands face up gets through to the next point. Anything that lands face down doesn't, right? Um, so it's it's one of those things where it's like they need a better system. And I think I, I can understand why a, a fan company or something that big, that scale, the most efficient way for them to find a good enough candidate um, is why that's useful. Now, I think the other two situations where I've seen that um, like the, the, 
the two situations where I see that work is one where a company wants a very specific role with a very specific stack, uh, you know, or tech skills that they're testing for. And this might be because they need to maintain a legacy system and they need to make sure that, hey, this person's actually got the experience to keep this thing going because it's system critical or whatever for X amount of months until they replace it. Um, that's the kind of situation where you actually care about exactly what someone knows and it's not so much about coachability and it's more about existing like knowledge. Um, the other situation where I've seen it work is where companies do a technical interview, but it's not done, but it's communicated really well that it's not a, oh, you've got to top this and get 100% to even have a shot at the next interview, right? That brings a toxic competitive mentality to any kind of test or screener. And I think we do see that a lot, right? Um, but really communicating that, hey, this is just a, a base understanding that you're comfortable reading Python code, you're comfortable reading an SQL query, right? And it's a very basic, it's a very basic level. It's just understanding, okay, we're not teaching someone to code from scratch here, right? Um, and communicating that is probably the piece that's missing where I see in a lot of tech screeners where they just chuck a leak code at you um, through an automated email. Um, so yeah, making sure that like, if you are looking for something very specific, you're communicating that and you're able to feedback. Uh, and if you're not, it is just a very basic, yeah, you can code a little bit, right? We can coach you on the rest. Um, those are the three situations where I actually see uh, it reasonable to use a, a yeah, a screen up. Yeah, I think I, I just got to say it this way, and I think you both kind of touched on this. At some point, like, why bother? You know, I, I get it. Yeah, you know, you're, you're an awesome company, but I got 15 other ones. You know, and that's really where a lot of people in tech are after about 10, 15 years. It's, I mean, it's a long line. So I'm going to pick the ones that are the easiest that actually want me. You know, and that's what I'm hearing more and more is people saying, look, if you, if you don't think that me doing the job for 10 years means I'm qualified to do the job, your leak code test is really going to pick up something different. You know, that's going to be the thing that screens me out. So it's really, it's an interesting dynamic where we don't, we don't bring realism into the hiring process nearly enough. And I think that's problematic. So I'm going to let Russell take us home. Then I saw Gina doing the uh, no a-hole remark as well. So I'm going to give Gina a chance to also take us home with a further expansion on Russell's no a-hole rule. Okay, shall I go first? Okay, so I was building upon Mikiko's great summary, actually, just about toxicity as a general uh, issue in the workplace. And, and I view toxicity as a, as a stealth poison in any organization. Uh, and um, it's stealth not at the coalface, face, i.e. not by the people that are doing the work day to day, but more so at the executive levels, i.e. you know, the the higher management, the higher directorship, or the or the or the C-suite, etc. And the reason for that is, uh, it seems to me, and I'm talking generically here. I'm not uh, targeting this at any one uh, organisation or company at all. Uh, but I think in most organisations, there's a there's a latent respect for the asshats that get results, regardless of the long term consequences. You know, and it's it's a short term view. You know. You have secured a you've secured a, a two million kind of um, pipeline of work in the next two years. There, actually, no, that's that's a really good. Let's talk smaller. Let's talk smaller number. You, you secured like a, a ten thousand cell or something here, yeah? and that's great. But what about if that that one person that's done that is part of a team of ten that are securing the the long term um, revenue, and that person's really disrupting that, so that the overall balance is falling down. Uh, then the um, the blame is thrown against those those other ten that do the long term stuff, even though it's not directly perhaps their fault, or at least the the fault lies with them is being caused by the the toxic individual. But if that's removed, there's going to be a um, an average lift to the overall. And I think that's something that's not understood very well, and it's generally due to this, as I say, latent respect for the for the assets to get results, unfortunately.
you know, you want to, do you want to add? No, I mean, I think Russell summed it up really well. I just put in the comment, um, Professor Bob Sutton at Stanford wrote the book, The No Asshole Rule. And, uh, you know, that sums it up. And I mean, he's worked extensively on this subject. Um, you know, a lot of times people, people seem to have gotten the wrong idea. You know, they look at people like Steve Jobs, and I might put Elon Musk in this category, especially Jobs was legendary. I know someone who worked for him back in the day, and the dude was, you know, not a nice guy, frankly. He, he may have been a genius, but even there, right? I mean, some, you know, it's a huge company. And, um, ideas and the way things were executed, it wasn't always, it's not like he did everything and then the minions just went out and executed it. I mean, there was a give and take process. And I think um, it might have been Jobs' biographer or maybe Sutton who said, you know, Jobs' success was despite his caustic personality, not because of it. I think that's just the thing that, you know, sometimes I see people, seems like maybe even younger, like really young people, they've got this idea that they have to be like that in order to get the best out of, well, get the best out of, quote unquote, out of people. And it just, yeah, Russell says, correlation does not equal causation. So true. Um, and, and the worst thing is, you know, emulating jobs or someone like him by wearing, you know, black turtlenecks and kind of acting in the same way as though that somehow makes you a leader and that people are going to respect you. You know, come on, folks. But I mean, Mik Mikiko's points were, you know, it wasn't just dumping, you know, I just want to emphasize, you know, what she said and then in the, in the chat, what she mentioned, it's not dumping on companies per se for doing technical screens, but simply saying, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing Nikiko say is you have some leverage in the market and you don't necessarily need to jump through all those hoops or simply you can decide, okay, is this the kind of company I, I want to work for? And yeah, Mikiko, if you, I mean, I think you mentioned early on in this call, the boot camp thing, you know, you, you saw someone making a comment about all oh, boot camp grads suck and, you know, come on, that's crazy. Um, you have to look at the individuals. Um, but, you know, boot camp grads, <laughs> grads or career changers such as myself, you know, I think feel like, oh my God, we have to do all this prep for these technical interviews. And maybe there's a, a a bit of doubt around our ability simply because we come out of a boot camp. I mean, that's a that is a one-dimensional type of a view. If somebody thinks that, despite everyone, but despite all of the other person's accomplishments, that would be pretty sad. But I'm sure it happens. So yeah, I just want to give uh, Makiko the last word if she has anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, if I ever decide to go bang or manga, as some people are calling it now. They're not. I, they're calling it Mang, but they really should call it Manga. I think that's a more brilliant play. Um, I am 100% prepared to pay the leak code tax. I'm ready to do it uh, at that point. But I think at every point in time in people's careers, I think at, at the end of the day, you know, it's, you can kind of rage against something, but you, you kind of have to vote with your feet in a way. So if you want to see more companies that have better interviewing process or processes that are a little bit kinder maybe to like your your skill set or, or person in your or in my shoes at, at that point um it's it's good to make that decision to then say like to know that first off you have that option that you don't have to actually take a tech screen there are companies out there but secondly to also make the informed choice of to say that you know a kid is willing to give up on like XYZ opportunities at Manga, right? Knowing that you they will pay the leak code tax, but they will be rewarded for it, but you will need to pay the leak code tax. Uh, and if you're okay with that, you can go for companies that, you know, have a hiring process for, you know, where you are right now. You can vote with your feet. And at some point, I think, you know, people like Vin are, are carrying on the good fight to let companies know that there are better ways to hire. But we can also help people like Vin by voting with our feet. So if we wanna see more companies without tech screens, let's interview for those companies without tech screens um, or the ones who are willing to do a more holistic process. Let's support them. 
let's rep them in LinkedIn. Um, you know, and also let's, you know, let's applaud people too who are able to get through the manga leak code process because it is grueling. It's, ex it's excruciating. So I'm very happy for my friends who are able to get through that process, even knowing that right now that process is not for me. So, yeah. Right. Uh, if only uh, Nick Singh was in the house for this topic. Yeah, I think, I think this is one of those things we could probably talk about for another two hours, just about broken hiring processes. But I think kind of circling back to Dare's question, I think we can definitely hire based on more sensible practices and more sensible measures of candidate value. An experience at some point is enough. A portfolio at some point is enough. Having a PhD, I mean, come on, what else do you want? You know, when you talk about somebody who has a PhD in physics and you say, I want to see data science experience, you know what you do to get a PhD, right? Do, do, do you not know what a PhD is? Did you, did you fall asleep when they were describing it to you? So I think there are always more sensible ways. And, you know, if we pursue the data, maybe we'll find those. But yes, please reward companies that are good to their people. You know, the ones that do not have the workplace psychopaths roaming the hallways and you know, the, those, those people that truly make your life terrible, which there's a lot of companies that do, and we have to call out the ones that are toxic and you have to really reward the ones that aren't, because if you start doing that, toxic companies go out of business. I feel bad because I got nothing to plug. Harpreet always does the, you know, like I'll be at the Riviera this, this Friday and Saturday night, Sunday at the Palms, Monday, the sand. No, I don't, I don't have anything to plug. So like Harpreet says, you got one life, but I highly encourage you to enjoy it first and then do something amazing because that amazing thing, you'll regret not enjoying it if you just do amazing. So have a great weekend. Thank you everybody for coming and hanging out through two hours. I really appreciate it. Harpreet, we miss you. And don't forget to check out Vin's uh, newsletter. He's got a Substack. Yes. On Substack, Google Vin Vashishta, you'll find all kinds of crazy things that you can follow me on. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.